Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bierko of Wall Street from Main Street. Today, my friend Aaron Basil and I from Carnivore Trades, we're going to do our annual half year market summary show. So we're going to talk about what we talked about end of December for 2023, our pre preview for 2024. We're recording this, this show on Wednesday, June 19th, 2024. The dollar index is at 105. The 10 year US Treasury yield is at 4.21%. It's been a roller coaster the last uh, six to nine months of yields on the 10 year US Treasury. It's acting like a banana republic emerging market yield. And the gold price has corrected a little bit, but it's still above 2300 at $2,327. Aaron, I want to get your thoughts on central bank liquidity right now. Do you think that central banks, like including the Federal Reserve Bank, European Central Bank, uh, the G7 ones, are they pulling, uh, putting in liquidity, taking it out? And how do you think that's affecting uh, the U.S. stock market or other stock markets right now? Yeah, so uh, officially, again, excuse me, officially, they're taking out liquidity. Um, but, you know, we've made new all-time highs, I believe now, um, close to 30 times, I believe, uh, on the SPX. I'm sure the NASDAQ is about the same here. And right now, as we're, as we're doing this here, uh, you know, looking at the E-mini, right now and it's sitting at all-time highs as i say this so um you can't have that without a, a liquid market um tight bid ask spreads and um you know low volatility so it's really hard for me to believe that there's uh a significant amounts of capital being pulled out pulled out of this market um it does seem that yellen wants to keep reverse repo kind of stretched out until the election. And, and it does look like that's going to be something she's going to be able to do, um, you know, based on the things that I've seen in this tape here over the last, really since November, we have not had outside of that little spike down that lasted a whopping, you know, six days um, where we had the Israel kind of um, bombing Iran, which is nothing really new, honestly. Um, outside of that, there has not been any sort of pullback here. Um, and this market does not behave like it wants to go down. That's a very, very liquid market. And um, I have a very hard time believing that there is any sort of quantitative tightening done being you know, at least a net net. Sure, they may be actually doing it from one's perspective, but they're putting it back somewhere else. There's no way that you have um, this type of price action here in the markets without with a heavily, heavily liquid liquid tape. And in the U.S. for the banking system, the M2 money supply is starting to rally. So that's probably going to help the banks start to buy. That's going to be converted into liquidity, too. And the banks are probably going to start to buy more U.S. Treasuries. That'll create some demand. But that liquidity is going to go in. So even though the Fed is officially reducing its balance sheet, like you said, the other central banks now, the European Central Bank, they just did their first rate cut since 2019. The Bank of Canada, which is also in the G7, although not very large, they also uh, cut rates, I believe, too. And then the rumors are, I think the Bank of England uh, a month ago was going to, uh, considering cutting rates, they'll probably start to cut rates. Do you think then these uh, G7 central banks, they've decided that they can't afford higher interest rates and they're going to let inflation run hot and that means more liquidity for the system? Yeah, it's very, it, it's interesting. There was um, kind of a theory going around where it's in 2022, the Fed out hawked the world. And now the world is trying to outdove the Fed. Um, yeah, these these countries can't afford um, to to run those deficit or to run that um, those high have those high interest rates. And it's ironic we had the ECB, I believe uh, it was earlier last week. I think um, they cut rates while at the same time, in the same statement, they uh, raised their forecast for inflation. So um, yeah, try to unpack that one, um, you know, however you want. But yeah, and I think stocks will like it, um, certainly in the short to medium term. At some point, inflation, when it gets hot enough, contrary to popular belief, inflation is not good for risk assets, um, not in real terms or nominal terms, but in the short to medium term, you know, a, a highly liquid market, you know, is a good thing and it, it's good for risk assets. And it looks like flight capital, like that liquidity from the other central banks, but also flight capital, whether that's institutional investors, say in Europe or China or emerging markets or retail investors in China, they all seem to be piling into what S&P 500 here in the U.S., uh, NASDAQ 100 here in the U.S., and NVIDIA and a lot of those uh, handful of MAG, uh, it's not even MAG7 anymore. I was going to say MAG7 because everyone has been saying MAG7. It's really MAG4. Uh, we were talking before we started recording, Aaron, a couple of minutes ago about the rallies in some of these stocks. NVIDIA, after the stock split, how much is it up in just the last like four to six weeks? 
So they announced the split on um, at their last uh, earnings date. It was around, uh, I believe, the 22nd of May. So that was not even a month ago, and the stock's up 42%. Now, keep in mind, at the time, it was a two point, uh, don't quote me, I think it was $2.3 trillion market cap. It has now overtaken Microsoft as the largest, most valuable company in the world at over $3.3 trillion. So it added a trillion dollars in market cap in less than a month. Um, this is not <laughs> this is not a, a you know a fifty billion dollar company you know going up forty two percent. This is a two point three trillion dollar company, basically a, almost doubling its market cap. You know, very in or at least close to that. And Nvidia in, at least in beat less earning. than a month. And Nvidia at least beat er their earnings, right? So I mean, like some of the momentum investors, like the investors business daily people, right, would pile in. The hedge fund algos would continue to pile in. But then you have companies like Apple, right? And Apple, Fred Hickey did an ex excellent interview with Adam Taggart over on his new uh, Thoughtful Money channel, going through like the earnings of Apple and basically saying that Apple has not had real growth in about 18 months. And Apple, I think just in the last uh, under six weeks, they added a trillion dollars in market cap too. So do you think this is like a combination of like central bank liquidity that's coming uh, from other central banks coming into the U.S., flight capital from other countries coming into the U.S. stock market, and then also what, index fund money? Index fund money. And, and um, also with Apple, that's true. They haven't been they haven't been making money. Um, yeah, I think it's about it's 18 months or so, but they announced a massive buyback and, you know, they're just financially engineering. And that's the thing with the buybacks, too. It's one thing if you do it while your stock is like Lululemon recently just did a buyback where the stock got, you know, cut in half in the last year. That's when you should be doing a buyback. Um, not just to financially, you know, engineer your, your, um, your valuation lower. Um, so there's lots of, um, you know, there's lots of tricks going on here right now. There's a lot of dispersion in the market, meaning that the market, the, the S and P is going up, right. Um, and you having a small handful of stocks kind of lead, whereas other things are not performing and then some days you know the the the, the mag seven or the mag four or the mag three and a half whatever they take a break and then you see those other sectors kind of pick up i'm kind of in the camp um that if this rally does continue which i do think it does uh i do think chips will cool off into the summertime and i think you you will see a rotation into some other sectors here uh, they're just too stretched at some point you reach a you know a critical mass and um, you need to see some other sector kind of take up the mantle. We haven't seen that yet. Um, I do think that, you know, I have a few ideas, but um, yeah, there's there's lots of reasons. Um, and again, like, you know, the, the bigger the bigger point is is liquidity, right? Right. Like you said, NVIDIA can have the best earnings, they can have the best margins, but their, their share price has been parabolic for months and months now. Um, that will not matter until liquidity comes out. Liquidity comes out, everybody's you know, got their pants down. But um, that's, you know, that's that's the case in the, the environment that we're in right now. I also saw that a lot of people were front running how NVIDIA is going to be changed. Their weighting is going to be changed in the um in the indexes. Yes. So I think yes. they're what weighted at around 4%. And so I think they're going to be have their weighting changed to around 20% of the market cap weighted. Um, Is it the uh, NASDAQ 100 index or is it's, it another? It's the uh, XLK. So um, that's the spider technology um, ETF. It's oh, it's not quite as liquid as QQQ. It's pretty close though. Um, but yeah, they're essentially I don't know the exact numbers, but Nvidia is getting the top weighting. So a little bit of money will come out of Apple, and some will go into Nvidia. And right now, it's kind of you know honestly, it's almost like free money because you know that at three fifty five p.m. on Friday, um, a bunch of funds, index funds have to buy it so they're but forced that, so isn't that so by the rumor sell the news. And, isn't yeah. that by the rumor sell the news though because a bunch of people for the last months have been uh i'm sure people had the inside information and were front running that trade oh sure sure but i'm just saying in the short term uh you know that's you know that they have to they're obligated to buy it uh market on close at uh friday at 4 p.m so they're you know you buy it now and you know make a buck off it essentially and some of the statistics for the MAG4, so we'll call it the MAG4. So like Amazon, Meta, uh, Amazon, Meta, um, Facebook, well, not Facebook, Meta. I'd say Microsoft and, and yeah, NVIDIA. Yeah. Microsoft and NVIDIA, sorry. So the main four tech companies, the big tech companies, 
I think the S&P 500 is up about 15% year to date. And those four tech companies, the large cap ones, have accounted for about 50% of the gains. So this is not a... Um, a healthy bull market, let's just say, <laughs> where like you're seeing these other sectors, like Aaron said, where they're actually growing earnings and free cash flow. You're actually seeing like a bifurcated real economy, but the the it's all about liquidity. As Stanley Druckenmiller would say, tell me where the central banks are either adding or removing liquidity, and he'll tell you what's in a bull market or a bear market. And I would argue that there's a lot of flight capital still coming to the U.S. capital markets, specifically into those large cap tech uh, stocks, and then also into the indexes, what the NASDAQ 100, the uh, tech one, and then the S&P 500. Yeah, I'm very interested to see the 13F filings at the end of quarter, because Stan, you mentioned him, he um, sold 71% of his NVIDIA state. So he still has some, um, this was last quarter as of end of, end of March, and essentially replaced that with IWM calls. So um, Russell 2000 small caps, that has been a laggard for a while now. Uh, I, I kind of mentioned here a minute ago, it, if this rally is going to continue, something else needs to take up the mantle. You're going to need some other companies to take up the mantle because eventually it just it's a matter of time. I, I don't care how bullish you are on chips. They will have a correction, right? It just it's the way things go, right? Can other sectors take over? And he has a lot of those calls as of at least March. I mean, it's been a whole quarter. He could have closed them out. But I'm very interested to see uh, how that those uh, 13Fs look uh, at the end of quarter, which is coming up pretty soon here. Well, also, there's going to be a huge oversupply of semiconductors over the next five to seven years. There's over 70 semiconductor foundries under construction or being expanded right now globally. So yeah, well, that's not going to mark affect- the market's priced in the everything great. I mean, and, you know, it is going to be great. But I mean, everybody's. Everybody's in it. Um, it you know, you, you, you can't surprise at the upside now. You can only surprise to the downside, and that's the risk. Are you talking about specifically the tech companies? Or because yeah, a lot yes, of these, yeah, because yeah, we're seeing like like down, bad earnings um, announcements for a lot of the other sectors. So they're not so I, I good. Think, I think a sector that could do well if chips top out is cloud. And that could even just be off of a uh, positioning standpoint. I read, um, I, I believe I include this in a video or two, but um, fund managers are historically, or at least at multi-year uh, lows, underexposed to cloud, and they're obviously at all-time highs exposed to chips. Um, you know, a residual AI trade, something, you know, cloud, Oracle and Adobe, CrowdStrike, their earnings were pretty good. Um, you know, they could be starting to play catch up here. I also think another company, just throwing this out there too, full disclosure, I do have some. Um, I think... Investors are not taking into account how big live sports will be for Netflix. Um, what's going on with WWE, with th- what they're doing? Um, they're having a lot of talks with the NFL. I think this is, you know, we're going to see this happen. Cable companies, look at TNT uh, recently. They're losing uh, inside the NBA. This is, a, you know, a show that's going on for 30 years. Um, cable networks are, uh, you know, are going away. And this streaming stuff is a, is a big deal here. Not to derail the whole conversation, but... Uh, well, so it's online sports. Well, I mean, the TV networks do only want to pay so much money, right? Because the every time they renegotiate a TV deal for one of the professional sports leagues, the cost is way higher. But you're seeing online sports betting; like people are betting like crazy on their phones. Oh, yeah. I guess, I guess it's part of like um, you, know, you and me are around the same age, so I guess it's part of what FOMO and YOLO that you have tons of people that are, are betting on their phones with um, sports games, sports betting during the game, fantasy sports betting during the game, and then like trading stock options or altcoins now. Yeah. And I, you know, I grew up right after I graduated high school was uh, the GFC. So I saw everybody, you know, my age who was told their entire life, oh, you just just work hard. You know, you don't even have to work that hard. But my dad was a mechanic. OK, my mom worked at a greenhouse and they bought uh, the house they still live in for like, I don't know, like fifteen thousand dollars or something like that. Um, you cannot do that now. So there's there's bitterness here and there's a desperation. And like you've said multiple times, there's it's like a bifurcation in the economy. It's and um that's kind of what's driving people to do these things. And a starter home, like you 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 mentioned a starter home. I mean, uh, those used to be cheap decades ago for our parents or grandparents. I mean, now like a starter home and a lot of 
uh, major metro areas, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars or more. A starter home in like the DC metro area, it's over $500,000. And normally a lot of younger adults my age are getting their parents or grandparents to either give them like the uh, 20% down payment or co-sign the mortgage. Sometimes some of them even have their, um, cause they have loaded parents or grandparents pay the whole thing. Yeah. 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 Down here in, in Florida. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's cooling off a little bit. It's still a pretty hot market though. I mean, where, where I'm at, um, you know, a, an absolute junker can still get like close to three. So, but as long uh, as you is, don't need a mortgage, <laughs> as long yeah. as you don't oh, need right. a mortgage, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you can, if you uh, don't need a mortgage, you're you're fine there. I mean, yeah. but if you need a mortgage on a high property or condo, I mean, the yeah. the cost Just come up with three hundred thousand. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the 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 average mortgage now for a, for a small place here in DC Metro is over four thousand. For a normal place, it's over six thousand mortgage now. So the like the real estate agents here are not getting a lot of sales lately. Yeah, the the one thing I'll say, we talked a little bit about this, but um, man, they they're putting up you know skyscraper after skyscraper. So there is some supply that is coming online now. But um, yeah, just uh, uh, you know, you cannot afford a, a home on a you know entry level job anymore oh yeah i agree so like the entry level homes now the cost of those are way higher than they used to be a lot of it's because of asset price inflation and the cancel lawn effect i want to ask you about the other stock market performances besides the u.s stocks so the japanese stock market the nikkei that one is close to an all-time high right but would you say a lot of it is because of the devalued yen well they've been trying to do that for as long as I've been alive, and um, they finally succeeded um, because of you know deglobalization, lots of other uh, you know global effects. Yeah, I mean it's 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 basically there. Looks like it's had a little correction uh, uh, lately, but yeah, they're they're devaluing that, and um, you know everybody talks about the Fed being in a box uh, with inflation and stagflation, but I mean the BOJ is the king of being in a <laughs> in a box right now. Um, but you know, as you and I have talked about, I'm glad you're bringing this up too because. Um, I think you and I were the first ones on this. I don't think that they're the yen right now is something, at least at this current time, is something that's going to destabilize things just because the, when they came out with that headline and they said, look, the United States and Japan agree on a devaluation. Okay, let me break down the word agree for you. That means they told Japan, don't sell our debt and you know we'll give you some swap. We'll open up these swap lines. Right. And I think that went over everyone's head. And um, I think a lot of people missed that. And they might be having to draw more swap lines soon because today the fifth largest Japanese bank just had it tripled the losses on bonds that the market was expecting a 10 billion loss instead of the 3 billion loss that was projected a week, a week to 10 days ago. And it's probably going to be even larger than that because they're they're telling the market now publicly in the guidance that they need to sell $63 billion worth of U.S. government bonds and European bonds. So they're claiming right now only a $10 billion loss, but if you need to sell $63 billion, sounds like the margin calls are way larger than they're claiming, Aaron. Yeah, I mean, um, and as you said, they have that the G7 uh, agreement in place. So, I mean, is there anything swap lines can't fix? Uh, they're going to have to go back in there. Uh, we'll see if that impacts. I'm not. I'm looking at the treasury market right now. It's not really. Um, doesn't seem to be too bothered at the moment. Uh, futures are down just a little bit, but it's not anything I would say is major. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a definitely an interesting time here, and we're still in a treasury bear market. It will there will be rallies in in uh, in treasuries, but um, I you know I I've been in this train for a while. You know I think this is a secular um, you know, change here uh, because the need for debt is. Uh, is is just different than it was over the last 40 years where you had that secular disinflationary kind of pressure it's not the same anymore so other than the u.s stock market indexes and the nikkei in japan are any other stock markets looking like they're in a bull market i know china had a rally recently in their stock market but do you think it's just a bear market rally i'm interested so i did get um one of my better calls in a while i did buy kind of that that bloodbath uh, in January in China, I was very, you know, very just kind of dipping toes in the water and um, played it a couple of times. It worked out pretty well. And um, I'm open to the idea of a continued rally just be based off of the fact that um, they're going to continue to devalue. Now, I am not interested in playing individual tickers 
there's too much risk in China um, it, it, to play those individual names, too much geopolitical risk. I don't like single company risk either, especially in foreign markets that I'm not as familiar with as, as the U.S. But I do think the indices are, I, I do think we will get another uh, a push up here in China after, you know, something of a pullback. Um, but to answer your other question, we do have other, you know, yeah, I mean, other markets here, um, you know, the euro uh, stocks 50 still near all time highs. Um, same thing with the DAX and, and a few others. So, I mean, there there is, you know, liquidity really being pumped in. And I, I think that it's it's these other central banks that, um, you know, they can't handle these uh, these debt levels and um, they're kind of caving here. And they, you got to pick one or the other at some point. And I think a lot of the retail investors in those other countries, China, India, Japan, Korea, other parts of Asia, emerging markets like Turkey or Argentina, I think we can see the demand that there's increased uh, levels of demand for gold, silver, Bitcoin, those types of things. So people are definitely hedging. I mean, the dollar index is still relatively high, despite all the shenanigans that the budget deficits for the federal government here in the United States is running and the, and the stuff the Federal Reserve Bank is doing with all the shadow liquidity programs and covert bailouts. But on a relative basis, these other currencies are weaker against the dollar. That means they probably have an inflation problem in those other countries. And those citizens are hedging the currency debasement risk. They're buying U.S. stocks. They're getting their currency out of the domestic currency. And then they're hedging with what? Bitcoin and gold? 100%. The dollar index is actually still very strong. And I, I'm, it, you know, I cover this every day in my videos. And, it, you know, if that can break 106.50 or so, the dollar's got some serious legs for a rally here. I don't know what that would mean for um, risk assets. And I'll the reason why I would say that is obviously traditionally or historically, you'd say, well, that would be bearish. But um, this year, if you look at the dollar, we ended the year last year at about uh, 101.50, we'll call it. Um, we also got up to about 106.50. And right now we're at 105 and change. Um, in that same time, you know, the S&P has gone from 4,700 to 55. So it's not always a perfect correlation. And um, we've talked about this before, too. The same thing with gold. Um, gold and the dollar have gone up um, and now gold and the stock market are going up. So it's different. It's different times. These traditional kind of models are breaking down a little bit. And that's what happens when you have, you know, a secular shift here where things are finally coming to a roost. Uh, you, also had, markets. you had similar rises, I think, in gold and the dollar in the 1970s stagflation, too. Yes. Yes. And that is a, a really good point. I believe the dollar index back then, it, it was very feared that it was going to crash and it didn't. Um, it actually kind of strengthened U.S. hegemony and the dollar, or excuse me, and gold also obviously had it, its bull run there. So these correlations, you know, you don't want to don't always want to fall in love with them. They can break down from time to time. Um, and we're definitely seeing that right now, even, you know, like I said, even not just with gold, but with stocks, too. So stocks and the dollar are um going up together and they're not really being bothered by one or the other. Well, Volcker back then, he saved the dollar with all those interest rate increases. And then he kicked off the uh, bond bull market that lasted about 40 years. But um, I think the Treasury, the U.S. Treasury yields got up to 18 or 19 percent at the peak there before the yeah. yields started to come back down uh, under Greenspan and other Fed chairmen for the bond bull market. But I, I agree with you. I think we're in a long term bond bear market. I mean, eventually the Fed may start to cut rates in the not too distant future. I think there's one projected rate cut now by the end of the year. We'll see what happens. It's not guaranteed. Um, we were we were making fun of um, you know, the dot plots, I think back in December, like yeah. how the market was projecting what six or eight, somewhere in that range of rate cuts for 2024. We're like, no way, no way that's gonna happen. They they um they had, I think, a hundred base. I actually listened to it a little bit last night because I wanted to refresh. Um, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, but it was a hundred in May of last year, uh, the Fed funds futures had a hundred basis points of rate cuts priced in by September. <laughs> <laughs> and the Fed the Fed raised all the way up until I think they the they last raised in September or October. Well, now we're going to start to see the lag effects in the real economy. It's made the real economy even more bifurcated. I, I would argue there's a lot of problems beneath the surface for regional banks and commercial real estate. Seems like every day now, Aaron, in a major city or metro area, 
a an office building is selling for over 70% discount for a pension fund or insurance company to get out from under the mortgage debt because they're underwater. Um, uh, the, yes, uh, the Moody's, uh, excuse me, the ratings agency, I think Moody's, they just downgraded another six regional banks. We haven't seen the wide scale regional bank failures, but they're in an ex in extend and pretend like accounting gimmickry, accounting fraud mode, very similar to what 2005, 2006, 2007 in the year or two prior to the uh, 2008 financial crisis with the uh, last real estate bubble. Although this one is not necessarily in residential real estate, I think the larger problems are in office space with the regional banks. Yeah, and I'm definitely seeing, at least anecdotally, um, and the data kind of confirming it too, it, it does feel like we're kind of getting that slowdown finally. Um, the data starting to show it. I know we had the you know, the jobs report, um, using air quotes on jobs report, uh, that said we created, I think there was 182,000 expected, and we created 272,000, which, I mean, even Jerome Powell <laughs> I mean, how how is that? That Jerome Powell is even questioning the accuracy of the reporting from the White House by saying that yeah, jobs numbers are overstated. Um, it was all part time jobs, and we lost full time. But um, you know, even anecdotally, I mean, you go out to eat now, and I I look, I look at a few things, and I'm like, I'm not going to pay for that just on principle. And um, I'm financially secure, but I know a lot of people out there aren't. So if I'm thinking that. I know there's people out there that can't afford certain things and they're probably cutting back. And I think we're starting to see that in the data. Um, and again, the jobs market is the last thing to go, but um, it does feel like we are getting close to a slowdown. I don't think we're going to have um, the 2% rates though. I, I don't think we're going to have anything close to that. I, I do believe there's too many secular inflationary pressures and um, the most likely outcome is stagflation though. Did you see the article that Ms. Shedlock put out in the last couple of weeks that uh, the government admitted Bureau of Labor Statistics and some of the other government agencies, Department of Labor, that they adjusted down the jobs numbers even more for, for the year 2023, so a year ago, and they admitted that about over 3 million of the jobs that they created with the birth death model and other adjustments were all fake. Yeah, and there was that, um, what was it, like a seven-month stretch where we had downward, revis uh, downward revisions every month. So, I mean, you know, and, and of course, the ADP number comes in really weak and jobless claims come in. But then, um, you know, non-farm payroll, which is the government number that comes in, you know, somehow it magically comes in strong. But I think the market's starting to sniff through that and the bond market's starting to sniff through that, too. We're seeing yields come down a little bit. Um, and I think the market is, you know, starting to sniff out a slowdown. It's just a matter of does the market start to get worried that we could go to a hard landing. I don't think we're going to have a hard landing. For, you know, I think the data will hide that. I think um, inflation will hide that. But um, and again, as long as liquidity stays there, I think you know the market can can fight through that. But the bond market definitely is, um, I think, confirming a lot of the data that we're seeing. And government spending is also counted positively as GDP. It's counted the same as private sector investment or private sector spending on capex. So. Um, you know, if the government's going to count like running these two trillion budget deficits as positive for GDP and the economy, of course, like you said, the the numbers are going to be fake. Meanwhile, you have stories of zero hedge, where like a lot of the private sector companies are apparently the jobs that they're listing that people can apply to. The jobs are fake, and the company has no interest in really hiring any of the people. Uh, I think half the jobs I think are estimated to have been faked uh, when people go and apply. But this is adding to the bond market volatility. I think that's probably the biggest surprise so far, Aaron, is how much uh, yield volatility we've had so far in things like the 10 years Treasury yield. And I think we're starting to see a supply and demand issue develop in the U.S. Treasury market. There definitely is. And it's it's interesting that um, you know, we talk about liquidity with stocks. You know, see, there's no shortage of liquidity with stocks. But, you know, these moves in, in bonds, it's very strange to see a stock market that is so stable and is melting up pretty much, you know, effortlessly and without much resistance, but to see a bond market that can move, you know, seven basis, but on the 30 year can move seven basis points in a few hours. And, oh, it's everything's normal. No, nothing to see here. Well, um, you know, historically, if that happened 10 years ago, the market would have crashed if the, if the bond market moved in either direction that quickly. There would have been a, there would have been a flash crash. They would have had to hit the circuit breakers. Wasn't the yield on the ten years Treasury wasn't it four point seven percent like six weeks ago? I, um, and well, now it's down to four point two. 
Yeah, it's at four seven down to four two. Um, yeah, and we're seeing, you know, like you know, like I said, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten basis point moves on a daily basis here. The one year chart go, for our listeners out there, if you want to see a roller coaster, look at the one year chart of the ten year US Treasury yield. It's literally a roller coaster. I mean, there's some big moves. It does not look like a stable market at all. Looks like manipulations and interventions. And, um, you know, just people going in there hoping that the Fed will cut rates and then it doesn't happen. <laughs> or there's like clear intervention. I, I, In my opinion, my educated guess, I mean, I've heard stuff anecdotally when when it hit 4.7, I, I think there was intervention. So like six to eight weeks ago when it got to 4.7 and there were people like, oh, it's going to five soon. I think I think the Fed and Treasury did step in. That is why the uh, Treasury is talking about this buyback program now. They're restarting it. It's um, not a large program right now, but they haven't done this treasury buyback program of bonds since the 1990s. And I heard the analogy in a video. They basically said that like in the short term, it's not going to do a lot. But in the long term, it's like paying off your mortgage with a credit card. So there's there's no such thing as a temporary government program either. Well, yeah, I I think because we're in a situation now, it's supply and demand with U.S. Treasuries, right? Because um, now you're adding in the interest payments on the rapidly growing national debt. We're almost to $35 trillion when we're recording the show. And we're adding, what, a trillion dollars every 100 days. But in the not-too-distant future, we're going to be adding a trillion dollars every 90 days. And even if the Fed cuts rates, the debt is so big now, Aaron, and Congress is not cutting spending I don't see the debt slow, the pace of the debt slowing down significantly. No, they're increasing spending, and we talked about that in the uh, in the in the December or January video. You know, they're basically issuing a trillion every quarter. Um, so that and, and then not counting a lot of supply and, on the market. You know, and then the CBO is not counting. Um, the CBO is not counting interest payments on the national debt correctly. They're not. They're the CBO projections are a joke. For um, how quickly the debt's growing? I think they said it would it would take like ten years to get to forty trillion. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of the C, well, all right. So uh, I'm glad you brought this up. So I know you get a kick out of this. Um, the other CBO, so CBOE, um, they are launching a new U.S. Treasury market volatility index. So it's uh, VIX TLT, and that's to measure the volatility in the um, and long long end rates which is insane the fact that we need that now it's not a, now it's not something you can invest in or or trade yet if now if if they make it something that you can invest in and trade in oh my goodness so is that going to be like an income think, product if you think false depression is bad in, in indexes you know honestly it sounds like it's going to be a new income product for like the um institutional investors so like the bond portfolio managers or the um hedge funds to sell vol. It sounds like they're going to do something like that and then expect the Fed to well, bail them out later. Specifically in the treasury market. But at, at this current time it's just it's just supposed to be an index so it's just measuring things. It's not actually a product yet but Okay, so but the steps that like um, Chicago with the options trader, the options market makers in New York is they have to build the index first. And then the plan is they want to make money off an index. Right. So they're going to start to sell options or futures or options on futures and other derivatives. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I'm just waiting for it. You know, they've you know, everybody's always talking about all they're 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 suppressing volatility. They're they're shorting the VIX. They're propping stocks up. Well, you know, how do you get, uh, how do you lower the market, treasury market volatility? Well, let's put this little index in here and, uh, you know, see how that does. Well, it's like a holding a beach ball under the water, right? So like, yes. yeah, they're they're keeping volatility low in stocks, but now like volatility is going crazy in bonds. Yeah. So I, I think it's, you know, if you want to put a tinfoil hat on, you know, maybe they're, they're doing that to, uh, at some point they know we need to, we need to, somehow suppress or contain this treasury market volatility and what or, or it's going to end up an income product but then it's going to be bailouts later so like any hedge fund yeah. or bank or institutional investor that or insurance company that tries to sell volatility right to collect options premium as an income product and leverage up they're going to make a lot of money now like an eig or some of these others and then they're going to blow up and this bond volatility aaron this is what's killing the banks. We're starting to see that now, all these surprises. I have been warning for 18 months uh, with that prior show that we did before the year started. And then, um, you know, on my Twitter and other interviews, 
warning that like the Fed keeping rates at these levels, the dollar rallying, the volatility in bonds, the problem with commercial real estate, this is going to hurt insurance companies. It's going to hurt pension funds. It's going to hurt regional banks here in the US and foreign banks a lot. And we're just starting to see another bank looks like the Jap the fifth largest Japanese bank is starting to crack. They're having similar problems to Silicon Valley Bank with um with the interest rate expo the interest rate movements now um on their bond portfolio. Yeah, um, yeah, we talked about that obviously earlier. So we'll see how that that plays out here. Well, Insur well insurance um, company. Oh, let Go me ahead. add to that. Um, it doesn't sound like a big bank, but apparently, and the research is coming out. George Gammon did a video on this, but um, there was also uh, prior articles on this. With the, I think in 2019 there was an interview with an expert on Real Vision. It's on their YouTube channel for free now. Uh, that like Japanese banks were getting heavily involved in collateralized loan obligations and other derivatives. So it's not just the $63 billion. So um, the mainstream media is going to say, oh, it's only a, a $10 billion loss now. It's no big deal. Or, oh, they're only selling $63 billion of government bonds and treasuries. And the treasury market is, in, uh, the short term one is enormously large and liquid. Well, that could just be a margin call. Right, Aaron. So that's 63 billion. That could just be the margin call for the next couple months. I mean, like there are other assets like on the collateralized loan obligation market. That's way larger than 63 billion. Uh, they could have bad commercial real estate that's illiquid. They can't sell it. Maybe they're desperate for any type of cash. So it could be way, way larger than the numbers suggesting. And they're an important counterparty for these derivatives traders, the euro dollar. So they, they may need like the swap lines, like you said, or other types of covert bailouts. I, it, yeah, I'm certain that um, th that's already kind of been put in place here. Again, you and I speculated on that weeks ago um, when the dollar yen was starting to to really uh, rally, and you know, you had traders and, and investors saying like, "What the heck? Why isn't why aren't things blowing up here?" I, I think they, you know, the Fed already knew they they kind of got in front of this, and they said, "You know, we're gonna." Um, make sure that if anything happens, we, you know, we have a plan and we're, you know, that's in place here. Okay. So you think then that they had an idea, maybe they didn't know it would be that specific bank, but they knew that Japanese banks were holding a lot of older bonds that had losses on them, commercial real estate. So the Fed knew that they were going to have to give the Bank of Japan additional dollar liquidity to help deal with this. So the U.S. stock market, so there wasn't a, a collapse or a flash crash or something. Yeah, I think as soon as you broke 150, 152 on the dollar yen, that was kind of the the last, you know, it's it's gonna it's gonna, you know, free run unless Japan reverses course. Um, and if they intervene, obviously we know what that means. So I think that they, you know, the Fed knew that that's obviously there's only two paths here, and um you need to at least get out in front of it to some degree. And I, I think they've done that. I'm not seeing any um, destabilization in the markets right now. So I would assume that they're doing something, <laughs> you know, we never know what they're doing, but, um, you know, like we said earlier, we're at all time highs, so they, they're definitely doing enough. But there's clearly uh, problems with these government bond markets, with the U.S. Treasuries and Japanese government bond markets. They can't afford higher yields. It looks like they're going to let inflation run hot. They're going to let the real inflation rate run above the government bond yield. The collateralized loan obligations though, I mean, Aaron and I were discussing this before we started recording, we went and looked it up. This Japanese bank, which is the fifth largest one, according to market cap uh, for the Japanese stock exchange, they're a market maker. It's been known for a decade that they're very, very active. Um, I think some of their main loans inside Japan are for like small businesses and uh, farmers and fishermen, but then they take that capital and then they go and do uh, investments into collateralized loan obligations. And that's like a lot of derivatives. And some people don't even know. I, I think a lot of the PhD economists don't even know all the stuff in these CLOs because uh, it's similar to mortgage backed securities. And this Japanese bank was a market maker, I think, in this trillion dollar plus market of collateralized loan obligations. Yeah, it's a new um, a new meaning to uh, the term betting the farm. Right. So. Yeah, you know, just taking those those loans from uh, you know regular people, leveraging them up. Um, you know, this is uh, this is what you know. It all goes back to moral hazard too. So um, nothing's changed, and uh, it's it's obviously gotten worse. And um, the derivatives market is is absolutely ginormous right now. It, they they say that the CLO market is about one point two six trillion. I don't 
believe that it's anywhere close to that. I think it's much, much bigger. Um, we know the derivatives market itself is a, a quadrillion. Um, and I, I don't, 1.26 trillion for CLOs globally sounds really low. That might be the claim that it's netted. So like the gross could be, so they could say, oh, it's netted out. And the net result is only that number. The gross exposure could be way larger than that order of magnitude or more larger than that. And all it takes, and we learned this from 2008, Aaron, is it only takes one large bank, like a Deutsche Bank, a Lehman Brothers, a Bear Stearns, um, a Credit Suisse, something along those lines, one bank to have problems paying off their um, counterparties. And then all of a sudden the banks stop lending to each other. The banks stop trusting each other. And then the governments uh, start printing money or changing the accounting rules to intervene. Right. And, um, you know, just doing the math on it. So if they have to pay 63 billion, um, that's that uh, theoretically would be 5% of the CLO market just disappearing. Uh, somehow I doubt that that would just be okay. So I don't think that for a second that um, the CLO market is that small. Yeah, I agree. I, I 5%, think this five percent in, in a few, you know, one one payment would destabilize something. Well, I think this sixty three billion dollar number. So, like the mainstream financial media right now, because it just the story just came out a few hours ago, is saying, "Oh, the losses are only ten billion so far," and oh, they only need to do about sixty three billion in bond sales. They're leaving out that the margin call that they have to raise the capital immediately for might be sixty three billion dollars. But if that's a margin call, Aaron, I mean, how much leverage did they that's use on right. some of their bond trades or derivatives trades? Right, and then it could be right sixty three billion just to get on, out from underwater, but then you might need to sell a little bit more to give yourself breathing room, right? Because that's, you know, like you said, it's that's the margin call. It's not like it just goes away. Um, if it keeps going down, you're gonna get margin called again. So they have to give themselves breathing room. So it could be a lot more than that. And their assets, a lot of the bank's assets that they probably invested in are not liquid stuff. So it's not all US treasuries that are short-term US treasuries that are liquid that they can easily sell. Could be office buildings, could be a bunch of, uh, derivatives contracts where it's tough to value these things or the underlying assets and the derivatives are bad. So it could be illiquid markets and the bank might not be able to sell the assets for the uh, prices that they were estimating. Yeah. And, and, then uh, we and yeah, with a, you know, a bank like that, yeah, they're not necessarily always investing in, yeah. And, and tips or anything, uh, you know, overnight stuff. So, yeah, that it's definitely it's definitely an additional challenge. They can only sell it to to other banks or other people who can afford to take take that on. Well, and um, doesn't can. hasn't the Federal Reserve Bank been buying a lot of tips the last ten years? Don't they own like twenty percent or more of all the Treasury inflation protected securities now? I believe so. Um, I think uh, I think money market funds have definitely increased here. Um, so there is a little bit more public public ownership. But yeah, it, the Fed owns quite a bit of them. I remember that being a story a year or two ago. But it's not silly like the Bank of Japan, because didn't bank the Bank of Japan, they own like an insane amount of Japanese government bonds at one point. And then they owned, I think, over 70 percent of the Japanese exchange traded funds for their stock market, too. They were buying like crazy for the last like 10 or 12 years to try to juice their asset prices back up. I think they finally said, uh, I want to say this was a few months back, they finally said they're going to start tapering their ETF purchases, um, which is, it's just absolutely remarkable. I mean, like, yeah, they're literally just going in there. I mean, if well, you can make if, a case that the Fed's what the Fed does, they just don't do it directly. They just put the the decimal point over on JP Morgan's balance sheet and then JP Morgan buys. It's the same thing, but yeah, just they literally just go into the market and, you know, buy stocks pretty much. Well, if the Japanese uh, Bank of Japan actually wanted to be smart, like a hedge fund trade on that, they should have cashed out of their uh, Japanese stock market ETFs at a profit there. And then they could have went and reallocated some assets and started to buy physical gold tonnage. But since they're like a vassal state of the U.S. in the G7, they can't really go and buy gold tonnage like that because they're going to piss off the U.S. government in D.C. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because then they'd be essentially kind of helping out China uh, with what China's trying to do here. But in, in terms of like inflation and real interest rates, though, it just makes more sense, right, to not allocate if you're a foreign government or foreign central bank, all of your trade surpluses, your foreign exchange reserves into U.S. Treasuries at this point, especially like post Russia sanctions. So you're starting to see smarter what dollar cost averaging and diversification 
for the central banks that are not in the U.S.'s direct sphere, so direct allies of the U.S. and the G7. The other ones are thinking of this more rationally and saying we need to diversify reserves away from U.S. Treasuries because of what the, the D.C. spending problems, the real inflation rate here in the U.S., uh, how the treasuries can be confiscated. And so for a central bank, there's not a lot of options for what they could buy for reserve assets. And that's putting, a, a I would say, a pretty strong price floor in the bid for gold. Yeah, 100 percent. And we're finally seeing that uh, that really start to play out. I mean, it took a long time, but that's kind of how gold is. Um, historically, it, it puts in these big bases and a lot of people and I, I have this kind of um, I have a little bit of a unique take on it. But I remember, you know, for a couple of years, at least recently, everybody was like, oh, well, gold has failed as an inflation edge because it's gone sideways from um, 2020 to 2023 until recently where it broke out. But it's, you know, these everybody's so tied and such a prisoner of the moment and stuck in recency bias. Um, what happened from 2018 until um, early 2020? So, you know, the price nearly doubled. Gold pricing in, I think gold prices things in a lot faster than people give it credit for. Uh, I think a lot of the, what happened the last decade was priced in by gold from, you know, 07 to, to 2011. That's why it backed off. Um, but it goes in these super cycles and, um, you know, then it takes a, a very long breather. And right now, since we're on the, the, the subject, that's really all it's doing right now. Um, it's had a really good run from February till April. Basically got halfway to everybody's price target of 3000 in about two months. And, you know, I see a lot of people, you know, complaining about it. But listen, guys, like this is actually very healthy. You don't want us going. You don't want silver going straight to $50. It's going to crash if that happens up sideways up sideways um very very healthy market here in the precious metals and um obviously like you said higher floors there and that's because uh you know there's a debt there's very very big global debt problem that cannot be solved and uh geopolitical tensions amongst many other things well, on the demand side, you have the reserve asset diversification outside the G7 for central banks. So you have like steady dollar cost averaging of gold tonnage each month. And then people just don't trust DC and the US government any as much anymore, especially if you're not in the G7, a major ally. If you do something that uh, and it pisses off the policymakers in DC, they could potentially confiscate all your foreign exchange reserves, as we've seen with Russia. So you're going to see more diversification that way. The demand side, too, you're seeing other currencies are being debased at an even faster pace than the dollar. So as bad as stagflation and shrinkflation is here in the US, I'm sure it's even worse in a lot of other emerging market countries. And so that's creating demand for physical gold. And um, that's why you've seen over the last, what, 18, 24 months, the gold price was actually at or near an all-time high in every other currency except for the US dollar, and the dollar was the last one to rally. Yeah, and it's interesting too. Is, um, you also have kind of Bitcoin kind of fit uh, fitting into that mix as well. It's, you know, if you look at over the last, really, even the last year, um, you just overlay like a chart of Bitcoin over a chart of gold, it's pretty much the same pattern. So there's there's definitely diversification going on. Um, maybe this is the moment Bitcoiners have been finally waiting for where, you know, gold and Bitcoin both kind of act as, you know, true alternatives. Um, but yeah, you're definitely seeing that that flight out of People just don't trust governments anymore. I mean, they've, you know, like like I was saying earlier about, you know, the millennials in my generation kind of being betrayed by the financial crisis, being betrayed. And then, you know, hey, you just work hard, you grow up, you do this. Um, and then, you know, instead of doing the right thing and then letting the banks fail and, and letting um, the market work, you know, they didn't want to give up their second boat or their their. Uh, vacation home and they bailed everything out and they they left everyone all the younger people uh with the bill so you you have you know generation now coming into political dominant dominance that doesn't trust the government and they're looking for alternatives i also think the real inflation rate has been way higher than the government claims on the cpi or the changing propaganda indexes which is what i call the consumer price index so i think the real inflation rate has been well above two percent for decades now and 
what the consumer price index. So you, uh, the people on business television are arguing about like, oh, the CPI is headed below 3%. Now there's deflation risk. What they're leaving out, Aaron, is all the people on Main Street, small business owners, you run a business, you see this with the earnings calls in a lot of companies. It's accumulated inflation now for many, many years, and it's only gotten worse the last five years. So they're leaving out all this accumulated inflation. I mean, I I have friends who are Wall Street bankers, so I get information uh, about the banks and regional banks and stuff like that, uh, problems with uh, European commercial real estate, all that stuff. And they're even telling me, in, and they wouldn't have brought this up in the past, that like their haircuts, their food prices, they were like back in 2019, they used to go out to Chick-fil-A and the bill was uh, less than 50% of what it is now. And that was only what, uh, five years ago, five or six years ago. Yeah, it's like I was saying earlier, um, you know, recently I've just noticed eating out. Uh, it's not that I can't buy these things, but it's like, I don't. I almost just look at it and I'm like, I don't even want to out of principle. And I know that. Well, it takes away. I'm so, at that. so over time, like for one meal, it's not going to make a huge difference. But, you know, over the course of monthly bills, your savings are going to get drained unless you're growing your income to offset this. And this means for the average person, a lot less discretionary income each month, especially like if your mortgage payment is higher, your insurance costs, uh, gasoline, electrical utility bills. Uh, rent or mortgage, food, like all the basic necessities, these things are all uh, maybe in the short term, you might have some price relief if there is like a, a stock market crash or something like that. But like over the long term, I mean, these things are all headed higher for the cost. So if you're going to get any deflation, it's probably going to be on consumer discretionary stuff. I'm seeing like Apple computer start to have discounts and sales. I'm starting to see sales for clothing companies. So it's it's just creating more of a bifurcated economy where like the average person doesn't have the savings and discretionary income that they did even a couple of years ago. And it's amazing, right? I mean, these guys have PhDs um, and they can't understand that accumulative inflation is what matters. Even if CPI goes to zero, that doesn't erase the fact that, you know, uh, a pound of strip steak was four ninety nine three four years ago, and now it's 12, right? So it just doesn't take it down any further. It just means it's not going down. So this old deflation or a deflation, I, I guarantee you, the average person in middle America would kill for deflation right now. Um, and by the way, speaking of asset prices, um, since we're on the subject, did you know that only as of this past week, the S&P 500 just took out its inflation adjusted highs? That's based on CPI, too, not off of, you know, actual economy statistics. So That's interesting. Even, even owning risk assets, you're still you have to be an incredible, incredible you know, money manager. And this is interesting that the traditional inflation hedges actually over long periods of time of inflation are actually commodities. However, if you go and look up the performance, I was I I, I had uh, forgot to jot this down in my notes. So this is really important that um, if you go and look at long term charts, say of uh, the price uh, price performance of say uranium versus uranium miners or um, the agriculture. Uh, index, which is what DBA versus the um, MU, which is the uh, agriculture producer uh, ETF, the co- basket of companies, or the gold price versus the gold miners indexes like a GDX or one of those. They've just like the producers have so drastically underperformed the commodities. And it's because of one of the major reasons, not just because of bad management, it's because of inflation, because the costs, the profit margins have been destroyed for a lot of these commodities producers that the profit margins and free cash flow are being destroyed. And then all the other factors with like ore grades, if you're a mining company, energy costs, uh, labor costs, those types uh, cost of capital. But it's basically that the um, if you go and track whether it's the copper price versus the copper miners ETF, uh, copper miners uh, yeah, index ETF. There's a few of those now. I think Sprott. Yeah. yeah, so Sprott just yeah. launched a new one now. They have a physical copper trust. But like if you go and look up the copper futures price, Versus the copper miners ETF, I mean, the copper miners have drastically underperformed the just the copper price. So they've been in a bear market for years. I think like other than the, the latest move, the last like six weeks in copper miners, if you remove that, I mean, the copper miners are zero for the last decade. Yeah. It, you know, at the risk of derailing this into an economics discussion, it's it's amazing. You know, they these 
The mainstream economists think that, oh, 2% inflation is a great thing. No, no, 0%. Infl that's why exactly what you just said. Inflation is the worst thing imaginable because even in a, a, in a heavily runaway inflation environment, these commodities producers, you'd think that would be the greatest place to be. They can't make money because they have costs too. They got to pay for the oil, gas, you know, um, copper goods. It's not as simple as, oh, price of uh, ag went up, so we just have better margins. No, your margins still can shrink. So that's why inflation is, it really is the worst. And, um, you know, I just find it, you know, almost kind of like detestable that, that um, there's this the narrative that still goes around, you know, PhDs and, you know, all these universities that deflation is the real boogeyman. Deflation is actually a sign of efficiency. Inflation is the opposite. Yeah, the free market actually produces beneficial deflation, but the people in power, the central planners, uh, Wall Street, they don't like bankruptcies. They don't like asset prices going for a long period of time. They don't like it normally when gold does well. But you have the PhD economists and deflationist financial Twitter, deflationistas. I mean, some of them, I've seen them post like pictures of themselves cooking Wagyu ribeyes in like a in a cast iron grill or other stuff. And I was just thinking to myself, like, do they realize the cost of those Wagyu ribeyes is up enormously the last six to eight, uh, last six to eight years is the price of steak is up enormously while they talk about how like deflation is a major risk. <laughs> or, or then you have Chuck Schumer uh, putting cheese on uh, raw meat. No, oh, that that was the worst staged thing I've seen in a while. <laughs> he was trying to he was trying to get like the act like a normie American, and it came off so bad. But now there's screenshots of it. Oh, this is terrible. Whoever's in charge of like branding or marketing, that's just absolutely terrible. It's it shows how tone deaf. I mean, he should stick to running his hedge fund like Nancy Pelosi and the other uh, traders in Congress. <laughs> They should stick to that so they can uh, outperform the the smartest, hardest working hedge fund managers on Wall Street who don't want to do insider trading um, because that's like the corrupt Cantalon effect system we have right now. <laughs> well, yeah, she's the she's the, the, the greatest of all time. Uh, her trading course is coming out pretty soon, I hear, too. Oh, really? She's going to step yeah. down from yeah. Congress and, and manage yeah. money full time now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, she could. She, she's uh, she's got the skills. <laughs> so um as we wrap up here i want to get your thoughts on surprises so far in the last six months so from when we recorded our preview for 2024 from december to, pre to present has anything really surprised you so far i'd say what i was um what i've been surprised uh with so far in the first quarter or first half of the year rather i thought that yields would put a little bit more pressure on the stock market in quarter one. I talked about that. Um, I said that yields would bottom in late December, nailed that call. Where I went wrong was I thought that uh, that would at least put pressure on stocks. I wasn't looking for a major decline, but I thought that that would give us a pullback. And again, going back to our original point, that's why I knew that they were really goosing this tape. And um, you know, kind of ever since then, I've really just not fought this trend and um it's worked out very well so i would just say what's really surprised me is that um how strong the tape has been um you know given things like treasury market illiquidity um and very thin leadership uh as the market continues to chug higher they've used what fake jobs numbers that are adjusted down later this artificial intelligence bull market narrative i mean the majority of companies aren't even making any revenues from the artificial intelligence narrative yet. So they haven't even built, we were talking before we started recording that um, everyone on Wall Street is starting to talk about the data centers and the capital expenditure build up. They haven't started building the data centers yet. So we're still a couple of years away from wide scale construction on these next generation data centers. There's over a 10 gigawatt backlog, I think was disclosed on a CNBC interview from one of the major uh, data center builders that does it for big tech. So there's like, those things are already paid for. They haven't started construction on these things yet. So yeah, it's nice that the copper price had a little bit of a rally, but if that's all it is, is a little rally. I mean, we're not going to make the investments we need into the supply side. A lot of the commodities, Aaron, other than maybe uranium, a lot of the commodities seem range bound and kind of uh, maybe in a downtrend temporarily, or do you think that some of the commodities are starting to bottom? I think uranium, uranium is still um, acting well, at least on the producer side. Um, it's very hard for me to read uranium futures because they're so thin. 
But from what I can see, you know, just looking at Camco, that is still in a very strong uptrend. Um, the URNM still holding up just fine. So no real problems. It's just backing off of a an overbought condition on the larger time frames. I do think that energy is getting a little interesting, uh, specifically like the XLE. Um, kind of around that 86 handle, I, I am kind of eyeing that uh, potentially for a bottom. I do think energy has another run. And um, oil specifically, I'm talking about just talking about the producers. Oil specifically, excuse me, specifically is a little bit different. Uh, you know, right now I'm pretty neutral. Um, there was a really good short squeeze, uh, a few, you know, over the last week or so. I'm not so sure where it wants to go into year end. Typically, it likes to rally into July. We could see something like that. Yeah, but we have um, an election, right? So, I mean, like yes. they've already started dumping more strategic petroleum reserve oil and who knows what they're doing with games on the oil futures contracts, right? So, I mean, like I think they're trying to keep oil prices in a range to help with the election outcome, but we'll see. Yeah, I and I think that the energy stocks, they don't always have to, to correlate perfectly to oil. I, I do think we're close to a low here um, in some of those names, but... Um, again, if they do really hammer oil, I, I would be a, I would be a very willing buyer. And, and by hammer, I mean, you know, a really big, if there was any sort of panic or anything like that, um, I think it's a buying opportunity, but I do agree. It is range bound. They might let it rise up a little bit into July where it typically likes to top out, but, um, I, I still see higher floors there and I'm not saying it can't have softened demand if the economy continues to slow, but. We're not going to see, you know, twenty dollars a barrel like, you know, some people are predicting with it with a slowdown, and gas prices um, still holding up. Uh, that is LNG. I, I think you probably base out throughout the summertime, and um, you know, you'll get your typical kind of fall rally there. Uh, the forward curve on, fu on gas futures is uh, still pretty good throughout next year too. And I think the oil price also had a correction based on the OPEC statement that more supply would come back onto the market next year. But let me just add that if the oil price starts to get weak and maybe it drops below 70 into like 65 range on, on Brent crude, I could see OPEC not only extending the current production cuts, I could see them uh, continuing increasing the production cuts because they want a higher price with all this accumulated inflation that we said OPEC does not want a low price. They need a higher price because they have accumulated inflation, higher costs too. They do not want to have to deal with that. Meanwhile, the, the oil and energy sector, Aaron, let me just add here, out of the entire profits for the S&P 500, the oil industry has around 15% of the total annual profits and only about 4% of the market cap. So there's good value there. And that's why you're seeing people, smart value investors who normally would not buy a lot of oil and natural gas stocks or commodity stocks, like David Einhorn and Warren Buffett, and you're starting to see them continue to accumulate oil producers and natural gas. I think Buffett's been buying, according to filings, uh, yeah, even more. A lot more this week, yeah. Yeah, Occidental Petroleum. So I think he's up to around 29% of the company for the shares right now for Berkshire. I'm wondering if he's trying to take them private. He's buying so much of that. Uh, probably, but you're also seeing you're seeing consolidation in the industry, though. So I mean, yeah. like um, you've seen Conoco Phillips announce a large deal, um, at least a buyout offer for Marathon Oil. The Marathon shares were going up a lot the last six months. I guess a lot of people had some inside information, maybe that Marathon was going to get bought. <laughs> but yeah, um, well, Exxon Mobil just finished the acquisition. What for Pioneer, sixty billion, and then they're fighting over uh, Hess or at least like the uh, Guyana assets. Yeah, and the, you know, the industry, yeah, like you said, it's consolidating. I think oil services uh, are in a really good position. And I think that, that con it, they've been kind of consolidating here for about a year. And I think that's getting ready to go as well. So I, I'm definitely getting more interested in energy here. And again, uh, going back to our earlier point, um, it could this be a rotation sector if chips back off? You know, do we see that happen? Uh, does money rotate out? Um, certainly could be a... Uh, something to keep an eye on here as we get into the second half of the year. Also, if energy prices start to get weak and metals prices, especially gold, silver, copper, stay relatively high, we're looking an even better profit margin for the precious metal royalty and streaming companies, but also for some of these well-run gold miners. So like a Lundin Gold or an Agnico Eagle. Now, all the gold miners, if, if the gold price uh, continues to go up, I guess a rising tide will lift all boats. But Except I there. mean, the... Hmm? Uh, except, <laughs> except for, <laughs> I, I think I could spend about 45 minutes to an hour bashing Bear Gold. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're a long-term tracker. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
But um, I think, let me just add, so we're, we're not going to have a Q2 earnings out yet for the gold miners, but I think this is the first full quarter where we're going to have gold prices at 2300 for the gold miners. So we're going to see if they can actually, you know, protect their profit margins and control costs. And for some of the gold miners, that will be true. Um, Newmont and Bear Gold for the Q1 earnings, uh, their costs were not so good. They're still trending in the wrong direction. I think their costs were almost up to 1500 uh, Have you seen uh, the charts, though, for the all-in sustaining costs over the last, like, three to four years for Newmont and Bear Gold? Yeah, well, Newmont's messed up with their hedging, though, haven't they? They're also, um, their costs, their ore grades, their costs, um, their labor costs, their pro ESG. I think they're hiring a lot of vice presidents that are in charge of like ESG and other stuff. So they're wasting a lot of funds that way too. It's yeah, not I just hedging. It, it's just yeah, those seniors are. I, I I know I know Wall Street likes them um, because they're stable, but I think a lot of Wall Street, I think a lot of analysts and and, and managers are kind of lazy in in that regard. Um, and you've been on this one for a while, and we've talked about it extensively before, but it's really not even close. Um, the outperformance from the the royalty and streaming sector, I mean, you can, the proof's in the pudding, you can just throw a comparison up there and it's not even close for those stocks compared to pretty much any gold miner. Well, look at the dividend increases by the gold sector recently. The major dividend increases after the Q1 earnings, they were from royalty and streaming companies. I think, oh, Cisco Gold Royalty oh, Cisco, announced it. Yeah. They announced an eight percent dividend increase, and then um, Royal Gold, I think, announced a seven percent dividend increase. And you're not seeing that with a lot of the gold miners. I mean, if their costs, if Bear Gold and Newmont, I, I saw an article on Seeking Alpha congratulating Bear Gold for maintaining their ore grades at one point seven grams per ton. Well, okay, that's nice and all, but if they're going to go look for ten million ounce deposits only, and they're going to go buy copper mines, I don't see their costs dropping back down to twelve hundred an ounce. I see their costs probably going up between sixteen hundred an ounce and two thousand an ounce in under a decade. If they're going to, you know, go and buy something that it has to be a certain size of reserves and resource, a certain grade, even if it's out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and um, you know, Barrick is, I think, like four times as large as Royal Gold, and they're not increasing a dividend. Well, of course not. Not if their costs have gone from $1,000 yeah. an ounce to $1,500 an ounce in the last three or four years. I mean, their their free cash flow is going to be nowhere near um, what the market was expecting. Yeah. And this is, this is why you have what uh, Aaron and I were discussing a few minutes ago, where you have the commodities price versus the producer and it's this way. So if you're a shareholder, say in a Sprott Inc., you get those physical commodities, you get the uranium trust, you get the gold and silver trust, the combination gold and silver trust, the platinum and palladium trust. If platinum and palladium start to rally, which um, I know what in December you said you thought that platinum and palladium wouldn't have a good year. They've been very, very weak. But um, from a contrarian value standpoint, do you think that they're one of the best for commodities risk, reward and value? Well, platinum has had a good a good move. Um, it has come off the highs, but it is putting in higher lows. Palladium is still at the lows, and I still really like it down here. I mean, even just as a, I mean, if you have speculative money, I mean, right at some point this will catch up. But I mean, you look at, you know, where this is. We're looking at essentially levels that we're at. We were at in 2018 with gold at all time highs, silver at multi decade highs. And everybody wants to chase those, but I mean, if you want value, I, I mean, the, your risk here is is very low. Um, whereas your upside, I think, is just it's just so high. It's very attractive to me um, to be in palladium. But platinum has has firmed up. Um, it has put in higher lows. It actually got up to eleven hundred an ounce a few weeks ago. It has pulled back since then. It's very volatile, but um, it, it has it has done okay. Palladium has been the laggard though. Those metals will have to bottom soon because uh, I've just been seeing articles lately about the suppliers of platinum and palladium and their costs keep rising. So they're in jeopardy, the producers, the miners of platinum and palladium, they're in jeopardy of either shutting down the mines or going bankrupt. So there's going to be supply issues there. The London Metals Exchange used to get a lot of source, a lot of their platinum and palladium supply from Russia, and they just put a ban on that. So they're going to they're not going to get the supply from there. And the other major sources, I think, of platinum and palladium for a lot of the mines are either South, South Africa or Zimbabwe outside of Russia. So um, there's not a lot of new supply coming online. 
The the reason I think the price went down so much, Aaron, is because the market thought for sure that electric vehicles were going to basically destroy a lot of the demand for the hybrids and internal combustion engine cars, which use catalytic converters, and so did the hybrids. And we're starting to see over the last what six to nine months that the market is wrong on this because <laughs> look at the look at the lack of demand for a lot of electric vehicles. Um, there's an oversupply. The manufacturers of a lot of these electric vehicle vehicle companies are either have either already filed for bankruptcy in the U.S. or Europe, or they're close. And um, you have well, without um, subsidies. What the, oh the other the other point I was going to make is like Ford and some of the other um, outside of Tesla Motors. The regular car manufacturers making these electric vehicles. I mean, I think Ford was losing over hundred thousand dollars per electric vehicle. They were losing that much money. That's insane. Well, they they were just doing it for the government credit. <laughs> right. They work hard for the money, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I know those the uh, the Chinese producers, um, Xpeng and uh, Neo. Their their share prices are still not really. They're, they're still pretty weak. So, I and, you know, the, the government's tried mandating. I think New York State, actually, I know New York State. Allegedly, they're going to have, uh, they're going to ban the sale of combustion engines by 2030. I, I'm, I'm very interested to see how that goes. Um, so they're trying to force it on, on, on the market. But, you know, obviously, that's an inefficiency. And um, we know the market will, will spit that out. So, um, yeah, but uh, I mean, just from a value standpoint, tucking some away here. Um, you know, if this was gold, right, and you were at 2018 levels, I think everybody would be buying a hand over fist. And natural gas has had its rally. So natural gas uh three or four months ago, I mean it was it was below two, and now we're yeah. already back up to three. It's not exactly at a great price, but we have had a nice little rally. I think we're gonna need a lot higher natural gas price going forward if the rest of the globe is gonna use import a ton of liquefied natural gas. And then we're gonna start using a lot more electricity. I think uh, China and India, especially India, their electricity demand usage, their growth rate is just going absolutely insane. I think it hit an all time high at the end of uh, 2023. And it's still, because they're getting a lot of factories in India, so they're manufacturing is starting to ramp up a lot too. Yeah, and I, I read they're still um Europe is still getting the majority of their gas from Russia. So those we're not getting that that um that supply off the market here in the US, but the forward curve has us up at um let me just double check. I think I got it right here. Yeah. So next year, January 25 at you know four four twenty on that gas. So you know, it's showing a pretty good recovery here. Um, obviously, the the market was absolutely flooded for a long time. Freeport shutting down and the and, and all that going on, but it does seem that uh, the price has recovered pretty nicely. And I think it'd have another run towards the end of the year. It might need to back off into the summertime, though. Well, also depending upon how the November election turns out, I mean, if Trump does win, I think a lot more liquefied natural gas projects will get approved for export to the U.S. Yep. So that could be. A lot of new uh demand usage to ship the gas off so I, I think that would put a higher price floor in the natural gas too so we'll see what happens with that um i mean if trump doesn't win i think there would be supply restricted here in the united states or less drilling uh but i could see uh because of the oil prices i think it'll it'll probably stay range bound for a short amount of time yeah it, and it typically seasonally it cools off into you know around june to august anyway so it, it i'm kind of expecting a choppy summer and then um you know it will probably pick up demand as we get towards the uh winter heating season but um yeah that's certainly a good point here and a good point too for uh, for oil i mean there's a lot in the balance here with this election as well and then you add in kind of a range bound oil price and metals prices relatively high especially because they've rallied a lot in the last uh since march even though there's a little correction. I mean, I think for the Q2 earnings for a good amount of these gold miners, uh, in the charts for GDX, does it look like it's building a nice base here for a potential bull market? Um, yeah, it does. So what I, I talked about this a um, few weeks, few months ago. Lately, I haven't been following it as closely, but um, there was many days and even weeks where the price of gold miners and silver miners were outperforming the metal, um, not just outperforming on a percentage basis, but on the on the chart. So uh, Friday, we'd put in a low, right? And then Tuesday, we'd put in a higher low. 
in SIL or GDX and gold and silver would put in lower lows. And that's something I haven't seen for a, a decade. And the last time I saw that we were, you know, we took off to new all time highs. So um, I, I am seeing that outperformance from the metals. And um, yeah, I just think we're basing here. I don't think that um, there's anything wrong. I actually warned about it a few weeks back on silver. I said, uh, this is not healthy. We're just going straight up. Uh, you don't want us going parabolic because it, it can, you know, it can end very quickly if that happens. But we started to back off going sideways. That's healthy. Um, and, you know, if you're if you're if you want the sector to have long term health, then then you're happy to see consolidation. Yeah, sorry. I just uh, the clicking there, I went and looked up the copper price. So the copper price is having a nice little correction in the last month or so. Got almost up to what five dollars a pound. It's down to four dollars thirty three cents right now. It's a decent price. The copper miners had a huge rally. Copper may have gone a little ahead of itself though, because there's been just absolutely enormous stockpiling for physical copper from both China and India. They've stockpiled just so much physical copper in the last three to six months. I think they stockpiled more copper in the last like three to six months than they did for all of 2023. I think they're looking, they're not actually using the copper yet. So um, I saw Andrea Steno, who does a macro show, put on his financial Twitter that they're not actually using the copper yet, but I think they're stockpiling the copper because they see what the big technology companies do. So like Amazon and Google and Meta and uh, Microsoft, that over the next couple of years, they're going to have to start building out those next generation data centers. So all the major governments, all their technology companies in the major economies in China, India, Japan, European Union, the United States, they're all going to want to get on this trend. It's just um, the investment other than NVIDIA with some of the chips, a lot of the um, actual physical investment and the building, the construction hasn't started yet. Yeah, and I mean, again, also, I mean, went from what, 360 to $5 in, you know, about two and a half months. So short really squeeze. Really, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, really powerful move. It, when it was at 360 and that was what October November last year I mean I was I was speaking off the record to some hedge fund people because they didn't want it um on a recording and they were these are Keynesian guys and they have like a perfect like resume for like worked at this investment bank or private equity firm started a hedge fund went to you know elite business schools elite undergrad Ivy League and they were like all short copper and other commodities i mean one of them was even short gold and copper and <laughs> and so like they basically because of their um keynesian deflationista bias right so they were short all the commodities and it I, i'm i'm assuming then that there was a big short squeeze on the futures contracts and the warehouses uh aaron for physical copper i mean they they got cleaned out we had we definitely had a short squeeze yeah, another uh, area I'm, I'm kind of interested in is, um, well, at least interested in maybe your take on is ag. Um, lately, we had a, I did, obviously, uh, I think we talked about it earlier. I had wheat earlier this year. I did get out for a nice gain. It took me a long time to get out of that. But um, yeah, prices of socks have uh, kind of come back in a little bit here. Is that part of, you think, maybe a the, the disinflation narrative or um, are they just cooling down for another run here? Um, I'm I'm not tracking the agriculture prices as much. Uh, I would actually like to see Sprott Inc. So I, I do occasionally speak with the people at Sprott Inc. Still, I haven't been up to the headquarters in Toronto in a few years, but um, I would like to see them come out with like a organic farmland real estate investment trust and try to capture those higher ag, ag prices. So like higher um, grass fed beef and higher organic vegetables or fruits. So I would like to see Sprott Inc. launch like a potentially like a dividend play in an organic farmland real estate investment trust. I think that would be a smart idea to add to the Spr uh, Sprott investment products because what they just launched a physical copper trust in addition to the uranium, the uranium one the last couple of years has been a big success. Yeah. And it's nice to have actual uh, trading vehicles uh, of these four retail investors because, um, you know, even, even if you can trade futures, it's, there's a lot of, you can't really hold long-term. I mean, you can, but you know, you're rolling, you're constantly doing this. There's lots of leverage you got to manage. It's nice to have uh, ETFs of some of these other things that there never really was before. I mean, ho I'm hopeful that one day um, we can get a oil and gas ETF that's not on a contango contract, but I'm I'm sure they won't let that happen because they, I'm sure they do a lot of money making because of that, uh, how those funds are structured. But um 
Oh yeah, they screw over retail investors, right? Yeah, <laughs> but, but we can get it. We can get a Bitcoin. Uh, we can seven Bitcoin ETFs, but we can't get a, a oil uh, ETF that's not based on Contango or, or natural gas. Well, I think if there was a de- the demand, I think Sprott will launch it. It might be harder though for them to store the oil compared to like actual metal and building out a warehouse. So I don't know. I could right. see if I could reach out to the Sprott people. But um, I've owned shares of Sprott Inc. for years. So that's the parent company. And they just launched these commodities ETFs. So for a while, the gold and silver, the physical gold and silver trust didn't do very well. But I I suspect going forward, you're starting to see more interest from hedge fund managers like Michael Burry and others. And they're not going into GLD. They're not going into SLV. They're looking at the Sprott physical gold and silver trust instead. Yeah, I've had Fizz uh, myself for a very, very long time. Well, you have to. So the the keys to those for listeners, uh, because I get questions on those all the time, is you can go to the website for the Spot Physical Gold or Silver Trust or the Central Fund. That's like a mix of gold and silver. And you can look at net asset value uh, discount or premium. And sometimes those um, the funds, the trust, they sell for below uh, substantial discounts to net asset value. So you can go and look up those charts. Sometimes there's a rather large discount to net asset value. I think at one point for one of the trusts, I think the silver trust might have gotten down to like a 12% discount in net as a value. So yeah, a lot of those trusts do that. Um uh grayscale was was really um notorious for that. It would underperform like crazy, except when Bitcoin was in a like a, a parabolic move. Then it would outperform. So yeah, those trusts have the the, the way that they um c- kind of operate, they, yeah, but they, you- they do deviate a little bit sometimes but you can't take a di- you can't take delivery though of um bitcoin though on the grayscale oh, trust course. can you yeah. so yeah so yeah. this is not like it's it, it sounds it, is it kind of like it's set up similar to tether <laughs> well i mean grayscale was it, it was a really crappy product and that was like the only thing that they would allow at the time now they have much better vehicles and honestly you know they don't even really need them because it's so easy to buy Bitcoin now anyway. But I mean, it's a convenient way to trade it, I guess. But um, and you're getting better. You're not paying fees either. Um, Coinbase's business, I think, will be in trouble um, in the next decade just based off of fees alone. But uh, that's a whole other story. Really? I, I mean, a lot of these Bitcoin exchanges have so many red flags and problems like over the last 10 years, starting with Mt. Gox and then ending in FTX. And uh, we, we're not even going to have time to talk about Tether. I mean, uh, <laughs> I've well, read some of the yeah. stuff and had some off the it's uh, Tether is like in the Caribbean, their headquarter. Right. So I think it's kind of a slush yeah. fund that's used by a lot of nefarious entities, governments and others. Well, my, my thought is that um, in a few years, every brokerage will have commission free uh, trading and I, every main brokerage that is, uh, and I don't think Coinbase, uh, they're going to have to change because their fees are still pretty, um, uh, it's still pretty Bush league compared to what you can get from even just a Schwab or uh, fidelity. Oh, okay. So you think they're going to have to come up with a new business model to make profits another way then? Yeah. I, I think the, I think the big, the big brokers will be able to just overtake them with, uh, margins and, and costs. Uh, there were rumors uh, that that Fidelity was going to try to buy Coinbase. I think they're a pretty large equity investor into it, but um, could, there were rumors. Hmm? I was going to say that they could do that too. They do offer a few coins, I believe. Obviously, Robinhood already does, but um, yeah, I think it's just a matter of time, honestly. Well, you've seen the. Um, there's been huge consolidation in like the online brokers, like E Trade and um, what TD Ameritrade. They've all gone bought yeah. by large investment banks in the last uh, year or two. Yep, TD just merged with Schwab. Um, actually, they, that's been a thing, but they've been rolling it out this year. So and, yeah, and Morgan Stanley bought E Trade, and I think like some of the other. There's other consolidation too. Yeah, that I remember when I started, there was a lot of there was a lot of brokers. There was a lot of banks too. This is this is a long time ago now. <laughs> So if I could wrap things up here, I think copper it was overdue for a correction. Um, there's still not going to be a lot of new supply coming online. It looks like the this long-term trend of the next generation data centers is going to use a lot more electricity. 
So China, India, the, the big tech companies, they're all going to be making investments into building these data centers. It's just that the data centers are not under construction yet. Here in the Northern Virginia area, you're seeing like Amazon, Microsoft, Meta start to buy large land packages. They're announcing that they're going to start building on these things soon. They just have not started yet. So over long periods of time, I think like that will be bullish for copper and um, normal conventional uh, forms of base load electricity like natural gas, coal. And nuclear power, but um, you know, I think copper was was overdue for correction. If if I would say probably for the rest of the year at least, if as long as oil prices don't spike and gold prices don't crash, I think things are setting up for pretty nice profit margins for a lot of gold prices for a lot of the gold miners. Excuse me, starting with Q2 earnings, especially if we start to get a rally in gold prices. But um, we're at a we're at a good price right now, Aaron, where the juniors are actually starting. This is the first time in over a decade, I would say, where the juniors are actually starting to do some drill programs, starting to raise some money, and it could be sustained if the gold price uh, stays at these levels or goes higher. I'll, I'll leave you with this here. I think that um, we get another rally after oh, into, into Q4. So end of summer, I think that's when uh, gold, gold and silver start to make their next move up. I, I think the gold and silver bull market has just restarted. Um, there will be uh, a lot of volatility and corrections, but I think the major issue here and the market is finally figuring this out is bear market and bonds, probably good for gold. So bad for fiat currencies, bad for government bonds. Um, I don't care if they're going to be offering a yield, uh, like a, a really high uh, quote unquote risk free yield. I mean, did you just see what the Chinese government did? They just sold a 50 year bond a government yeah. bond at an ultra low interest rate. I mean, if I'm the Chinese government here and I just sold a 50 year bond at a low interest rate, seems like the plan is to inflate that debt away. And they've taken that cheap capital, the fiat currency and what they're probably going to go buy gold tonnage. They're probably going to go buy warehouses of copper or, or build another, another strategic petroleum reserve full of oil. Right. And, um, and you know, like you said, so if the treasury market is unstable, where do people go? Go to gold for instability. But if rates start to come down and the market expects, you know, Fed intervention, that's also good for gold because uh, you have, you know, bond buying. So it's a really, really favorable environment. Um, and I think that the only thing that's really going to take it down is market mechanics, you know, like we said, the correction, normal um, ebbs and flows of the market. And I think that's all we're really seeing right now. Wait, you think that yields going down is good for gold? Is that because the market would interpret that as more liquidity and more inflationary? And then that means asset risk on and asset prices get juiced and all the liquidity is going to end up going into a lot of different things. Is that is that your thesis for why gold would do well if uh, like bond yields start to go down? Yeah, um, yeah. Rates down, you know, dovish Fed. It's good for gold as um, it makes it makes it more attractive versus yields. Um, but then again, on the other side too, if yields are going up, that's a sign of instability. And you know, what's the most ultimate? What is the ultimate stable asset? It's gold, of course. So I think it's in a very favorable environment, regardless yeah, so, of where, whether a treasury liquidity is uh, up or down. Yeah. So I think Aaron's point here is that gold is in a pretty good spot now, given what the governments, all these governments and central banks, have done the last five years with fiat currency creation, and then the governments went on deficit spending. And now we're getting to the point, it looks like, with a lot of these governments and central banks where they've hit their limit on how much the government can afford on interest rates uh, with the total amount of debt and interest payments on the debt. And the governments, whether it looks like it's not starting with the Federal Reserve Bank with the rate cuts starting uh, in the other G7 countries, but they're going to start to let inflation run hot and they're potentially going to start monetizing debt. And, you know, the math just does not work with the supply and demand issue for the budget deficits, the interest payments on the debt, D.C. spending and the lack of foreign demand for U.S. Treasuries, who's going to buy the Treasuries? So either they're going to have to stuff them into the banks, Aaron, uh, here in the United States. So that's probably why the M2 has been rising lately. So the, the banks are probably going to start to buy some more government bonds. But then ultimately, the Fed's balance sheet's not going to keep falling. It's probably going to have to start expanding soon to monetize that government debt and to uh, what some type of yield curve control. And then that's probably more inflationary if the Fed's balance sheet is expanding. And um, that's probably also good for gold. Probably also temporarily good for other stocks too, the stock market index. It, yeah, it, it would be, I think stocks would love that in the short term. Um, but once inflation really comes home to roost, 
that's when it will become problematic, right? So, you know, if you look at the 70s, and again, not that that's like a perfect comparison, but, you know, we went sideways for 15 years, um, but lost about 70% in nominal value. Um, so it's there, there, there can be short term gains from this, but um, it's it, it destroys margins, it destroys the consumer. Um, it's just it's not a good situation to be in. Yeah, and there's a lot, there's some similarities to the 70s stagflation, but also differences. Cause I mean, the US was still a creditor nation back then, but also in terms of like asset prices and markets, back then there was no derivatives market. It was no nothing close. I mean, they just launched gold futures contracts back then. There wasn't all the crazy options and derivatives and day trading and all this and uh, you know, leveraged hedge funds doing leveraged short volatility trades and all the other income generating shenanigans that uh bank portfolio managers and hedge funds pull off. Yeah, and our debt to GDP was what, like a tenth of what it is now? It it would have been unthinkable back then for the size of government now. Um, and so like it took a very long time of conditioning, but now here we are with like the government's gonna spend for fiscal 2025. I'm talking US federal government here in DC, they're projected to spend about eight trillion dollars. And that's not even counting the interest payments on the debt. Yeah, well, I mean, and then <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> we're still we're still supporting Ukraine proxy war, and now you've got Israel um, that hasn't even really fully heated up yet. I mean, that's a whole other can of worms we could get into. But did you see that um, uh, the ammunition factories? Mm, and I'm I'm against wars, but like th- how inefficient the U.S. is. Like apparently, there's uh, shortages now of like all the ammunition, but all the ammunition's old. And so they don't have enough um, supply for copper and other stuff, and they're not manufacturing it properly. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Well, and they, and that's what they got AI for now, right? They can figure that out. Uh, the robots are going to make, uh, are going to yeah. manufacture the stuff. Yeah. NVIDIA is going to save the day. That actually, um, there is a, now most of the um, Air Force uh, fighter jets are, are um, manned by AI, uh, computers and AI. That's interesting. I mean, I'm not surprised if there was like an autopilot or something, because like a lot of what the larger um, commercial airlines, the jets are uh, a lot of them are besides takeoff and landing or autopilot. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. um, They they, the computers just do it. There's just a person there to make sure it doesn't, you know, nothing happens. Well, as long as Boeing's not manufacturing the parts, right? (laughs) Well, yeah, or um, you know, putting together a hit list. Well, um, there I, I've seen someone. Uh, someone was trolling me and telling me, "Oh, Boeing didn't manufacture the parts; it was their supplier." I mean, like when you're a large company like that, you're still responsible for quality control and managing your supply chain. I mean, if they can't do that, if they're that corrupt I mean, and inefficient, I, I read an article saying they were pulling like broken parts out of the dumpster to save, and thought that they could um, get away with it. Yeah, that that that's not going to hold up in a court. Um, Oh, it was the other company's responsibility, but he still sold the part. Well, when you're that large a company and you can't manage your supply chain, I mean, you have to take responsibility for it. You're making all these profits as a large publicly traded company, your managers. I mean, you have to be able to manage your quality control and your supply chain. You have to test the parts out. I mean, people could die on that stuff. That's gro- It's clear. It's criminal gross negligence. I mean, we'll see what happens in court or lawsuit settlements. Uh, I did go to law school. I think it's criminal gross negligence. Uh, normally, they they uh, assign comparative damages. It depends on the um, each state, though, or if it's a federal case. Well, and and it just in general, it doesn't matter who your supplier is. If you're still um, selling a product to the end user, you're responsible for everything. Th- the damages that happen should something go wrong. Yeah. And I mean, there's video evidence of this, right? So they can't say that it was like a, it was a a fake video or something like that. Like the Biden administration is saying, I mean, there's tons of videos of like the, the doors on the plane falling off or wheels falling off. It's it's just sad that things have gone this bad for uh, large companies in America and the state of uh, the government with both parties. Yeah, absolutely. Well, unfortunately, Aaron, this is what happens in a in a fiat currency environment with bailouts, the Cantillon effect and stagflate tax lie. Welcome to dystopia. But I guess our listeners out there may as well profit off some of the asset prices and whatever uh, assets going to be in a bull market from central bank and government liquidity. 
Yep, don't forget uh, waste, fraud, and corruption, too. Oh, uh, I see it I every day. All your, I love all your uh, little uh, acronyms, all your little sayings. Well, th- thank you. Uh, the government em- the government employees <laughs> that listen to my show and send me nasty uh, tweets and emails and uh, social media messages with uh, not their real name on the accounts, they do not like that. So, <laughs> yeah. well, actually, they give you all those ideas, though. Yes, they do. Um, yeah. they, some of them are the worst hypocrites you could possibly imagine. Yeah. Well, yeah, I actually, to Princeton, so. Well, I didn't bring up this anecdote, but actually, like, I know one of the lobbyists for General Motors, and they live in, a, like, a giant mansion, and so, like, while they were doing, like, the whole electric vehicle campaign, they were just buying, like, super expensive sports cars and, like, um, gas-guzzling SUVs. Yeah, that sounds like uh, sounds like our government. <laughs> yeah, uh, especially uh, well, Nancy Pelosi. I mean, like uh, our, our government's uh, politicians that that also like um, dabble as hedge fund managers. Yeah, I mean, and and she's retired now, so I think she can do what she wants as far as trading. Not that she ever cared to begin with, but. Okay, well, we're ranting too much. We've been over an hour. Uh, hopefully, our <laughs> listeners got a lot out of it. But in terms of the rest of the year, I think the gold miners are setting up really nice building a base. Uh, some of the commodities are in a uh, uh, trading range temporarily. And the market's kind of waiting to see. I think the market's waiting to see when the Fed will start to cut rates. If the market doesn't start to get the rate cuts and some of the other earnings are bad, we could see a correction. Um, a lot depends on the commercial real estate, the regional banks or other these other banks and how uh, the, the policymakers decide to do with the liquidity programs or the bailouts. But, um, you know, if they let uh, I think, unfortunately, the main lesson that the people in power in D.C., like the regulators, the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, the Treasury Department, they were learned the wrong lesson from Lehman Brothers. And instead of letting banks go bankrupt and fail, and uh, punishing with uh, deflation and bankruptcy, they, their lesson was they shouldn't have let Lehman Brothers fail. Yep, again, going back to moral hazard. Okay, great. Well, thank you for listening to the show. And this was your uh, half year summary show. And um, we'll see what happens. Um, there's going to be more liquidity. I think Stanley Drucker Miller is on to something. And that's why he's produced such great returns over his career for the last uh, three or four decades is he watches these liquidity flows from governments and central banks, uh, who's adding liquidity, who's removing liquidity, and which asset markets they're going into.